security trust at CST. And the question I pose is why is it protecting British Jewry? And uh, in truth, uh, it begins with uh, at least a, a, an opening understanding that I uh, had the opportunity to spend the, the better part of a sabbatical uh, a year in, in England. And uh, a number of works that I did came out of my time there. Um, I had the chance to speak extensively and interview many, many people, those involved in the Jewish community, those involved in policy, in Westminster, and in various aspects and areas uh, of British political life and Jewish life. Uh, a lot of the work that I have been producing since that time comes out of um, that experience, and uh, including uh, the material uh, that I'd like to share with you this morning. It was not necessary for the 87-year-old uh, Israeli Prime uh, President Shimon Peres to tell Professor Benny Morris in his far-ranging interview published in Tablet that, quote, there is in England a saying that an anti-Semite is someone who hates the Jews more than is necessary, end of quote. Despite his subsequent qualifying statements, Peres' remarks were ridiculously undiplomatic and impolitic, but sadly true. Only this past year, Robert Wistrich and especially Anthony Julius have laid out in hundreds of pages the present and past history of English anti-Semitism far more eloquently and uh, extensively than, than I could do, can do, or would bother trying to do. This paper is not there for an effort to question their observations and analyses, or to even qualify them, although obviously some of the work that uh, they deal with I comment on indirectly. <coughs> Recent corroborative evidence in England concerning anti-Semitism is wide and broad-based. It has ranged from the recent food boycotts, divestment initiatives, academic protests, and political statements, all of which are one of the latest in a wide range of contemporary initiatives to debase Jews, devalue Jewish contributions, and delegitimize Israel. At the end of these various demeaning attacks, the critics then suggest that they have no bone to pick with British Jews. They are merely protesting against the politics and policies of the government and the state of Israel. There is little to be added to that transparent charade at this conference. There is, however, a side to this discussion which does need to be discussed. What precisely is Anglo Jewry doing to combat contemporary anti Semitism? More precisely, how effectively are the Jews of Britain demanding that governments work to combat anti Semitism? Has a time arrived where Anglo jury needs to be more take on a more assertive role to demand that the bureaucracy and the political system take a much more serious posture and responsibility to protect Jews and to prevent anti-Semitism? To set the record straight at the outset, CST, the Community Security Trust, is the model of all Jewish defense organizations. It is serious intense, efficient, and well-organized. The lay leaders, directors, the staff, and the volunteers have a total commitment to protecting the Jewish community and fighting anti-Semitism. CST demonstrates how research, activism, education, community relations, and outreach can all be housed effectively under one roof in the Jewish diaspora for the purpose of fighting anti-Semitism. From its inception, CST has sought to ensure the safety of Jews and Jewish community throughout Great Britain. As CST states in its mission statement, and I quote, CST's aim is to provide the community with a high level of security, with as high a level of security as possible to combat these anti-Semitic threats, enabling Jewish community life to be open, proud, and strong, end of quote. CST has done remarkably well over 16 years, over the 16 years of its existence. It's recognized with the Jewish community, the public, the police, etc for the extraordinary element of safety and security that is delivered and ensured for the Jews of Britain. Their leaders, their schools, their synagogues, and other institutions. They have done this despite the fact that the British Jewish community, Britain's Jewish community, has endured an extraordinary and alarming rise in anti-Semitic incidents, which of course CSD and others have documented over the past 10 years. 
It is similarly clear that Anglo jury recognizes the importance of the role that's, that CST plays in permitting Jews to live with a significantly higher level of physical safety and security. It is universally recognized that CST is on the front lines, daily fighting anti-Semitism, be it with pu making public statements in the media or in, assist in assisting in responses to acts of vandalism or reporting actual physical threats against Jews. In recent years, in terms of visibility, CST has become one of the largest Jewish charitable organizations in Britain. I'll qualify that in a moment. The annual CST Gala fundraising dinner is one of the largest events on the annual, Britain's annual Jewish community organization, organizational calendar. Perhaps somewhat comparable to the annual spring banquet held at the policy conference of the Air American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, in Washington, D.C., the CSD dinner attracts political leaders and government officials from across the political spectrum. In 2010, there were 1,200 attendees of the gala. This dinner, which while clearly focused on the Anglo-Jewish community, is the most impressive public display of Jewish political clout presented by the usually reticent Anglo-Jewish community. The Jewish community's support for CST can be measured best in the financial support that CST receives from Anglo Jews. According to the Charities Direct, the 2008 calendar year, CST received, received contributions totaling 5.8 million pounds. By way of comparison, CST's success, it is worth noting on a national basis, aside from these groups directly, aside from those groups directly linked to Israel, or those providing social service care to Jews. In need, Jews in need, CST's fundraising success is quite remarkable. And I go through an analysis of the specific other groups and what they what they uh, receive and don't receive, and the extent to which CST is doing extraordinarily well. Well, there's much more to, to be said about CST. Its extraordinary effectiveness is also the basis for the questions and concerns that I alluded to earlier. To reiterate, CST does an extraordinary job. It's problematic, however is that at a theoretical, institutional, and political level, there are questions as to whether the British Jewish community should act more directly in fighting anti-Semitism in Great Britain. The question revolves around the issue of what, in a democracy, ought to be the correct role of the state. Specifically, how effectively must the state protect its citizens? Coincident with that comes the question as to how much citizens should demand, i.e. pressure, the state to provide. And finally, what are the costs? or gains for exerting that pressure. The state has a role to protect its citizens in the nation, both at home and abroad, by ensuring that all the citizens live in safety and security. Failure of a democratic government to perform this function effectively ought to call into question the role of the state. There has never been a serious question as to how far a state must go to protect its citizens from external threats, though there have always been policy debates as to the matter of priorities. It is when it comes to domestic dangers or internal threats that democracies have, democracies have historically had their most vigorous and vituperative debates. Policy, priorities, and budgetary resources always engage a variety of ideological considerations. Nevertheless, there should be few differences as to the priorities of domestic protection and personal safety. Secondarily, and equally important, although a bit outside the major purview of this paper, is the matter of how Jewish charitable funds are being used in Britain. By dint of the existence of CST and its needs and the services it provides, one might consider what portion of those same resources and funds might be available if the state actually provided the necessary services to protect the Jewish community adequately from anti-Semitism. Now we all know, for example, as it is in the States and elsewhere, that when it comes to anti-Semitism protecting Jews, you can always gin up the Jewish community and put up money. When it comes to matters like a Jewish education, religious institutions, there's always a tremendous lag behind in terms of fundraising. That having been said, there's still this open question. Finally, the question arises, what could or should the Jewish community and its elite should do, if anything, to try to change the behavior of the state? Now, in my paper, I go through an extensive discussion of the work of David Miller, Michael Walzer, Robert Gooden, and others concerning the philosophical and theoretical questions involved as to what is and why the role of the state ought to be to protect its citizens, how they develop the various questions. I deal, obviously, with the entire question of um, the, the nature of distributive justice, the alternatives and options of 
uh, particulars, ethical questions versus universalistic ethical issues, and how the, these theorists address the larger question of how far and to what extent the state should be involved. Uh, I'm not going to labor on it, just make a couple of comments that I think point to the, the sharpness with which some of these questions should be, should be looked at. Um, Walser, in, in his discussion, for example, talks about while, the, while needs are subjective, the general welfare and security of citizens is clearly among the most basic and pivotal requirements that a government provide. Walter w Walser writes, for quote, the first thing they, meaning members of a political community, owe is the communal provision of security and welfare. Walter then, well, Walter then there continues and explains how various communities throughout history, citing Athenian uh, attention to democracy, uh, to drama on the one hand, in the fifth and fourth centuries, and Jews focused on education during the Middle, middle Ages. Drama and education were financed with money that could be used for services that modern societies view as far more important, such as health care and assistance. All of that having been said, when it comes to security, when it comes to physical protection, as Walzer points out and others, there is no option. According to their calculations, and, and to which I certainly agree, considering the, the, the number and amount of available services, government must provide for the needs of the community, and until the accumulated wealth of its members is entirely wiped out, that obviously has not been reached in Britain, there is no end to the amount of protection that they ought to be provided. If government does not want to cut existing programs to meet the request of a Jewish community, or any community, to protect them, they must amass the resources by increasing taxes. Historically, British Jews, however, have never sought a high profile. Choosing to assert a high, prof a high profile would mean urging a shift in government and urging a shift in government priorities as well as organizational behavior. It is precisely these demands that the Jewish community should be making, I suggest, and that are and that are the very services that the state should be providing. In fact, curiously, one of the positions expressed in opposition to making this demand suggests that demanding that the state carry out its responsibilities to protect synagogues, Jewish schools, Jewish leaders, and Jewish institutions will necessitate providing a similar set of protection services to Christians as well as Muslim institutions. Indeed, if couched in, if couched in terms of a universalistic interest, and even if presented by a joint or broad-based coalition, it might enable the Jewish community to help itself in its own needs, while at the same time providing an opportunity and interfaith dialogue and joint community action. This could be with Christian groups, Muslim groups, Sikhs, and all other denominations. And thus, having also given a philosophical and ideological de de development and direction, let me comment a little bit about why organizationally, I believe, uh, the, the situation in England demands a change. Um, to, to give this a clearer context, let's, re let's reflect a little bit on the nature of how Anglo Jewry has behaved and is organized in response to anti Semitism. Well, some of the things, some things have changed after the, uh, after the war. There, are, there still remain a political social ambivalence among Jews as to how to respond to the British government. Their behavior continued to reflect the traditional confusion between two conflicting streams in English society. On the one hand, there was the espoused openness and tolerance inherent in British democracy, which demands and prides itself in acceptance of the other. On the other hand, for the English, acceptance of, or tolerance had genuine limits. It generally meant to stay in your place, to not to demand too much and to move to you, or you leave. Towards Jews, in other words, this was a benign or enlightened form of anti-Semitism, precisely the anti-Semitism to which Shimon Perez referred. Historically in Britain, except for the medieval blood libels that led to the expulsion of the Jews in 1290, once they were readmitted tacitly under Cromwell in 1656, there, was never, there were never any pogroms or physical attacks waged against the Jews. Jews were welcomed and tolerated, but never really truly wanted, desired, or accepted, except for the job that they could do to help the existing order. 
Couched frequently in euphemistic language or packaged in legalistic codes, this situation, I would suggest, has persisted until recent times. On financial commercial circles in Britain today, relations with Jews appear to be quite cordial. There remains an underlying presence of anti-Semitism, which is not discussed. When questions of Israel are added to the mix, anti-Semitism becomes more transparent and even acceptable. Whether it appears in the roughness and expletives expressed against Israelis and Jews at football games, or whether it's mass manifested in the genteel, proper dining conversation among the chattering class, anti-Semitic biases consistently reared their head. In considering the political behavior and organization of the Jewish community, it's clear that at a certain point, for distinct reasons, Anglo-Jews changed their modus operandi, although it's not been simple and has not been without great foreboding. Uh, I discussed the nature of the, the, the Six-Day War, how that affected the psychology of, of Jews everywhere throughout the world, and of course, uh, in Britain as well. I also discussed at, uh, at great length the, the nature of the Soviet Jewry movement, how that universalized and allowed Jews to engage as well with uh, those on the left and bring them into a, an issue that was in fact Jewish. Um, and uh, I, I'm not going to try to go in, into that. I just would like to recall for you that, that there's a classic timidity in the British uh, Jewish community. Uh, and how they approached government was through the using still the Stadtplanet uh, model uh, of political advocacy, even to and through uh, contemporary times, I would suggest. Uh, Coincident with these political events, the Six Day War, Soviet Jewry, and so on, there have also been institutional changes within, Anglo within uh, the Jewish community which have affected the organization, the operations, and the political behavior of Anglo Jewry. While many of these changes initially were related to Israel, they were also, they, they were also as a result of the enabling Jews to become more focused as a result of their engagement on fighting for Soviet Jews. Specifically, it is well worth noting the following political arrangements that have developed between Anglo-Jews and the British parliamentarians. For example, beginning quietly in uh, 1957, Labour Friends of Israel was established. Through the LFI, Anglo-Jewry made a major effort to cultivate and organize supporters for Israel in Parliament and to influence how some in Britain saw Israel, Jews, and anti-Semitism. The creation of LFI was followed later in 1974 when its counterpart, Conservative Friends of Israel, was formed. These groups really took hold during the Thatcher years, and the <coughs> these party-affiliated groups sought to encourage MPs within each party to visit Israel to get a first-hand understanding of how the state of Israel saw its problems in the Middle East conflict. It was hoped that these visits would result in MPs being more aware and sensitive to how the government and the people of Israel assessed matters related to their own security and safety. In terms of the anti-Israel, anti-Semitism that is rampant today on many British Jewish, on many British university campuses, it is important to note that already in the 1970s an important pro-Israel effort was initiated on these campuses throughout the country. While LFI and CFI would work to raise an awareness and sensitivity, sensitivity to Israel in Parliament, on campuses, local, regional, and national officers of the National Union of Students were interacting with their politically active Jewish contacts and counterparts who were part of the Union of Jewish Students, which was established officially in 1973. These relationships ought not to be minimized. It is suggested, and this comes out consistently in all the discussions, that virtually no factor would be more important than the dramatic shift of support by British Jews to the Labour Party at the end of the Thatcher years, and especially in the 1990s, when the close relationships were formed at universities beginning in the late 70s, by Jewish and non-Jewish political leaders. I should also point out that um, when you interview MPs or, or their uh, assistants and, and you talk to uh, uh, members, they, it's very, very clear to them how they built friendships and relationships. And there's a mapping that I did between uh, contacts that people had and the people that they knew at university and how that developed in terms of the strengthening of relationships between Jewish leadership and political uh, access, entree, and involvement. For the New Labour Party, it was a double win. British Jews, even on the more left-wing campuses, saw the New Labour Party 
shift its backing more demonstrably in support for defending Israel, safety, and security. As a result, many Jewish campus activists also transferred their allegiance, allegiances to the new Labor Party. These ties became the bedrock for many of the strong relationships of labor, which, <clears throat> which many Jews have still maintained and who served labor so well in the Blair years. Uh, finally, LFI, LFI and CFI fostered friendships that were established on university campuses as the campus leaders moved into political and commercial arenas as well. Uh, what one further additional phenomenon that occurred in this arena was uh, the creation of BICOM, the British Israel Communications Research Center. Operated somewhat similarly to APAC, BICOM sought to address on a nonpartisan basis the entire array of issues between Great Britain and Israel. It supplied media information, fact sheets, briefing programs, and so on. Its existence alone is significant in terms of the relationship, and it was further example of anglo jewry empowerment. As it relates more directly to anti-Semitism, uh, and remembering the Holocaust in 1988, a joint venture of government, political forces, and private charity created the Holocaust Educational Trust. It sought to emphasize the use of formal and informal education about the Holocaust, not only to teach about the past, but to prevent any further occurrence, similar occurrences. It also sought to affect curriculum changes in schools. While a long time coming, as a result of the work of the Holocaust Educational Trust, since 1991, the government now requires school curriculum in England, Wales, and most of Scotland to contain a component on the Holocaust in the history studies of students between the ages of 11 and 14. In addition, the government sponsors and, the, and Holocaust Educational Trust conducts a travel program each year to Auschwitz Birkenau for two 16-year-old students from every secondary school in the country. Beginning in the fall of 2009, the Holocaust Educational Trust began conducting teacher training programs jointly sponsored by a private grant and government funds. To the focus, to this, the focus was to teach out against genocide and anti-Semitism in general, and the Holocaust in particular. And of course, the establishment of uh, Holocaust Memorial Day, the, the wing of the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, London National War Museum, are other manifestations of further work in this regard. Um, I think that uh, I, I want to make quick reference to uh, two other things in this area, uh, one of which is critical. First, uh, the work, uh, one of the done by um, um, my, my colleagues here who were, were at one point very involved in, in as you know, the Anglo-Jewish community, um, in investigating the behavior and conduct of the various organizations, especially the Board of Deputies, and produced a uh, lots and lots of recommendations specifically in how to change the organizational life uh, of it, of, uh, of the community. And finally, uh, in terms of the Jewish community, the creation of CST. Nothing rivals the success of the ability and, and the creation of CST. Um, it began in the 1980s as a secu community security organization of the Board of Deputies. Uh, as such, it sought to continue the mission established in the 1930s when some of its forebearers had served as the Jewish Defense Organization against Oswald Moles. Gerald Ronson formed the CST for the purpose of protecting Jews and Jewish institutions in Britain from anti-Semitic threats and attacks. It obtained its own tax-exempt status in 1984, 1994, with Ronson as the chair and Richard Benson as the chief executive. The CST believed it was time to place the issue of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic acts directly before the Jewish community. They also opted, as I think I suggest, in trying to change the, 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 the functioning of the community itself. Finally, in this, rea in this area in Westminster, there are also some movement. After many years of actively working in the House of Commons as, uh, as a lay leader, as well as a lay leader in the Jewish community, Greville Janner, the MP, now Lord Janner, decided to formally organize an all-parliamentary group on anti-Semitism. The establishment of this group considered today to have been largely a public admission by some of British, British political leaders that 50 years after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism continued to be present in England and throughout the world. Labor MP John Mann's elevation to direct the group and his decision to revitalize it in August of 2005 
and the establishment of Commission of Inquiry under the leadership of uh, Dr. Dennis McShane, uh, MP, was the, probably the most significant political action taken uh, in this area. For the, for the Americans here who don't know, I mean, all party parliamentary groups are as meaningful generally in England as what we call in the state's political caucuses. They're there to make the pressure groups, the interest groups happy, to make everybody feel good. They don't have a major function in general. They sit, they meet once a year, twice a year, they raise a bit of money, they do a little visibility. They don't do anything. That's what's so extraordinary, in fact, about this particular group. It actually moved dramatically ahead. Uh, Mann successfully brought in Ian, Dink, Ian Duncan Smith, the former leader and now member of the cabinet, uh, uh, the, the former Tory leader and now member of the cabinet again, and uh, Chris Yoon, uh, also a former uh, a leader of the Liberal Democrats, and now also a member of the cabinet, to join in the leadership positions with the all-party parliamentary group. Other group, other members sat through, sat together there. They, they held their investigation, the Hentic Commission of Inquiry, and they asserted that despite changes that have occurred in Britain since the Holocaust, anti-Semitism was still a very serious problem, which was now, now enjoined and inflamed in a major way by growing anti-Israel, anti-Zionist feeling. As early as uh, April 2004, Mann himself had said in Parliament, and I quote, the subterfuge that such people, that is anti-Semites, used was Zionism. They seemed to think that quoting the term Zionism made everything okay and meant that they were attacking not Jewish people, but Zionists and the concept of Zionists. But that was a subterfuge, end of quote. The fact that the Commission inquiry successfully persuaded the Blair and Brown governments to issue their report in response to the uh, all, parliamentary, par all party parliamentary group uh, initiative is itself unprecedented, in, according to many political scientists in terms of the, in Britain, in terms of the nature of, group, of these groups' behavior. In addition, the speed with which this was accomplished suggests not only the consensus that surrounded this issue but also the political effectiveness of the group's leadership. It indicated undoubtedly that the group was well-connected inside, as well as outside of Parliament, especially within the Labour Party. Furthermore, the ongoing and monitoring of the recommendations and their implementation suggests a genuine change in how far many segments of the political, legal, and constabulary forces are prepared to go to facilitate the investigation, minimization, and reduction of anti-Semitism in England. At the same time, that these positive and constructive moves occurred, there continue to be and have grown over the past decade expressions of pent up anger against Israel, Israelis, and British Jews due to the continuing unresolved tensions between Israelis and Palestinians. It is especially present on university campuses, at academic conferences, and in academic unions. While the inquiry and the government report, and obviously the International Parliamentary Congress, which it, at its urging was held uh, a little bit over a year ago, uh, are very significant to the situation in Britain following the war in Lebanon in the summer of 2006, the anti-Semitic activity on campuses, the continuation of the explosion after the uh, Gaza war, uh, suggests clearly that the problem and the acuteness of the problem. Uh, the May June 2010 Gaza flotilla attack brought out some demonstrators but nothing like those that have been seen previously. It doesn't suggest that the situation is under control. It suggests that it didn't happen in response to this event as badly or as demonstrably as it had happened elsewhere. Uh, now, let me try to put together something quickly on the, the nature of the politics and the policy direction and change that ought to be developed. As has the entire Jewish world, Anglo Jewry changed since the Holocaust in how they view issues of anti Semitism. After six million Jews were destroyed simply because they were Jewish, nothing can be the same. The changes in England become more evident, become evident more than 40 years ago, became, became more evident, excuse me, became evident more than 40 years ago, developed more clearly over the past 20 years, and have become sharper since 9 11 and since 7 7. British Jews do feel more secure, not because of the disappearance of anti semitism but because they now have a different voice and new options. As a community, they have become more responsive and the community's architecture has been reshaped. 
The Jewish community today is better able to respond to the significant, even increasing anti-Semitism in Britain. While traditional forms of anti-Semitism continue to exist, they have been surpassed today by the growing anti-Israel, anti-Zionist feeling about which we have discussed extensively here, which seek to demonize and marginalize Israel and to then assert that such attacks against the Jewish state are not evidence of anti-Semitism. As has been cataloged by the CST, the proponents of attacks against Jews today are directly linked to events in the Middle East or associated with attacks against Jews. Uh, Jews today are such outbreaks frequently led by academics, human rights advocates, public intellectuals, and those on the, extreme, on the political left endeavor to draw a fallacious distinction to justify anti-Israel behavior as not anti-Semitism. Support for the Palestinians generates significant demonstrations against Israel, more specifically against Jews, synagogues, cemeteries, Jewish institutions, and so on. The use of the apartheid image when speaking of Israel and a visual verbal analogies to Nazis have become commonplace. This is the form of contemporary anti-Semitism. Um, and, and as I suggested to you, the, the, the nature of the behavior of the, in Westminster, the, the nature of uh, uh, the CST has been very much a sea change in the British Jewish community. But there's something wrong here, as far as I can understand, with this more encouraging picture of Anglo Jewry. While progress has been made, changing people's attitudes and beliefs is much more challenging. There are some specific changes which I, which I believe could be implemented that might reduce the level of visible anti-Semitism and the concomitant fear that it generates among Jews and within the Jewish community. It has been shown citizen protection is an obligation of the democratic state, and this responsibility is incumbent on the state at the expense of all others except external threats. Then there can, and that there can be no compromise when citizens have demands and needs. Similarly, citizens in a democracy have the right to practice their religion without fear of possibly endangering themselves, their houses of worship, their schools, as well as their supporting institutions, their clerics, their professionals, and their lay leaders. When one faces possible physical danger in seeking to practice one's religion, the state is clearly not doing an effective job. In addition, if a state's inability to provide these fundamental guarantees necessitates a religious group to provide it for themselves, the state is at fault. As the Labour MP Dennis McShane observed, quote, it is not right for any group of British citizens to dig into their own pockets because they feel there is not adequate protection for their right to express themselves religiously or culturally, end of quote. Regardless of how effective CST is in protecting the Jewish community, its use of incredibly generous charitable pounds for functions that the government ought to be performing is wrong on its face, as well as misplaced use of charity. At the end of the day, all governments are constrained by budgetary resources. Budget decisions are determined by political leaders who establish policies for the use of funds. The problem in the fight against anti-Semitism in Britain is that governments appear to be unwilling to make funds available to have the police and other constabulary forces perform their appropriate role within the state. In the United States and in almost all other British oh, European democracies, on the other hand, police protect synagogues actively, institute regular surveillance, provide a regular police presence, active political, uh, active presence. In Britain, Attacks against Jews, defacing of Jewish property, public harassment, and intimidation are not addressed effectively enough by public authorities. Authorities do not do enough to prevent or deter such crimes from occurring. Providing Jewish citizens adequate protection and ensuring the security for all those seeking to practice their religion is essential. And it's not that it should fall on a private organization within the Jewish community. CS2 may be doing an outstanding job, but it is spending millions to perform a job the state must perform. For the Jewish community, this should no longer be an acceptable arrangement. Jews ought to demand that the state protect the Jewish community, its leaders, its houses of worship, and its communal institutions, its cemeteries, and its social service agencies. Worshippers attending synagogues or students attending Jewish schools must not be required to tolerate hateful speech, acts of incitement, biased crimes, or discriminatory actions. Perpetrators need to need not to fear 
that they won't have adequate police protection. Much of this change can and must come with a change in attitude toward government and a more direct and frontal approach in advocacy by British Jews. Protection of Jews and Jewish interests in Britain is not the same as engaging in pro-Israel advocacy. One can make the case that Jews in Britain can and should seek to influence British policy in the, Brit in the Middle East. How and even what positions to adopt can be debated. Demanding protection for domestic anti-Semitism, on the other hand, is not debatable. There should be no hesitation among Jews to make policy demands that will influence the state to provide adequate protection to all citizens for all and any biased crimes. For example, anti-Semitic outbursts and threats of physical attacks, plus an overall aura of fear as a result of the Israeli attack on the Gaza flotilla, while anticipated, was unacceptable. Civilized discussion over the wisdom and legitimacy of the policy is totally legitimate, but not anti-Semitic attacks against British Jews. Just as the British government needs to do more, much <coughs> to, to, to do much more than issue statements, establish investigations, and provide funds for biased crime victims, the Jewish community needs to learn to be more assertive in both demanding the expenditure of resources by the state to prevent and deter anti-Semitic incidents. Admittedly, England is not the United States. 300,000 Jews do not compare to 6 million. The political systems are different, although both are forms of democracy. But persistent anti-Semitism and degrading of Jews 70 years after the Holocaust are intolerable and demand tactical changes. As was this, Wallace has discussed, that organized Jewish community has changed. Nothing to justify the timidity that persists, as far as I can tell, in how Jews seek to confront their tradition. The leaders of the Anglo-Jewish community need to enter the 21st century. There is nothing to fear. No one has been killed in Britain since the 12th century. <coughs> they have to learn to petition government in a more active manner. Many Jews have felt uncomfortable being Jews in England, especially over the past 150 years, but Jews did not face physical attacks except for one or two slightly isolated incidents. Passivity and the shtablon mentality of our previous period no longer is appropriate. The model is slowly being displaced by more proactive and energized Jewish leadership, but far too slowly and meekly. A story told to me specifically by an insider in the Blair government points this out. A minister gives a Jewish leader his business card, which includes his mobile telephone number. He expects the number to be used. He does not expect the individual to suffer through days of telephone tag before getting resolution to a pressing matter. This individual said if he didn't want him to have his mobile number, he wouldn't have given it to him. The leaders of the Anglo jury need to enter the 21st century. There is a need to, to fear, not, not to fear, any kind of repercussions. There is also a need for education. I discussed the nature of how education could be changed to, be to also be included under the notion of prejudice reduction, bias, crimes, human rights education, etc. Both increased Jewish advocacy and education will impact as well on how the English are dealing with their growing multifaceted Muslim population. Sens sensitivity sensitivity um, to Muslims and their needs runs, today runs into conflict with the fear of a growing radical Islamic faction developing within the country. Britain is struggling to reconcile its long-standing romanticized affair with the Arab world, its fear of possibly possible growing radical movements directly under its nose, and a history of active as well as latent anti-Semitism. This also explains in part Britain's sympathetic views of the plight of Palestinian underdogs despite Israel's dog in pursuit of democratic values. Finally, it is necessary to consider what one now can expect in the fight against anti-Semitism from the new David Cameron-led conservative liberal Democratic coalition government. Cameron, Cameron did not distinguish himself during his recent hopscotch, hopscotch trip through, through the world's hotspots, especially when he used his visit to, it, to Turkey to reiterate his government's criticism of Israel's handling of the Gaza flotilla. Israel might have been worthy of disagreement for its action, but its remarks were a necessary and gratuitous slap at Israel while visiting the other major national player in the incident. In addition, this new government needs to, provide, to prove to the Jewish community that indeed it is not following those forces in the country as well as those in its liberal democratic coalition wing who appear to be willing to accept the linkage of Jews and Israel implicitly 
if not explicitly. Anglo Jewish leaders can and should be using these moments in the early months of the new government, even though it is beset with serious economic issues, to lobby aggressively for increased funding for community protection. Anti Semitic acts are racist. Efforts can be made to join these issues so that additional resources are available to protect Jews, Jewish institutions, synagogues, and schools. Jews do not need to accept excuses of money, no money, bad times, not now, Israel or other crises. Fighting and preventing anti-Semitism is an essential part of the role of the government. Providing funds for victims of anti-Semitism is not sufficient. Part of the reason the state is not as aggressive in preventing anti-Semitism and anti all biased crimes might well be because Jews, like all English, do not want to stand up and actively pressure their government. If Jews wish to stay in England, they need to change themselves and how they act. They need to be proud English Jews and not weak Jews. CST should continue its own independent monitoring research function as well as liaisoning with police. It can also assist the community and the police with its own effective alert system, but it should not be performing the role of the state. Thank you. For your presentation, for your judicious analysis, and for your prescriptions at the end, which I think are uh, important in the context of interventions against anti-Semitism. I, in some ways, am responsible for you being here because I <coughs> thought the rubric of inter interventions against anti-Semitism was something that really needed to be talked about. And I'm particularly thankful to have uh, David Feldman of the New Paris uh, Institute for the Study of Anti-Semitism here, as long with, along with Dave Hirsch, who, in, in my estimation, in terms of the intellectual battle against uh, <clears throat> against anti-Semitism is really uh, leading the charge with his engaged website. We will talk about that in my presentation, and um, <clears throat> I, I, I hope that we can have time for a little bit of a colloquy or a dialogue uh, at the end. I changed my title a little bit. Is now Interventions Against Anti-Semitism in the UK, Strategic Topologies. For those of us in the communications business, finding the right word can be a challenge. When talking about anti-Semitism, specifically when discussing the subject of responding to it, this task assumes complexities all its own. Personally, I feel I tend to avoid the words that suggest such fighting or battling. Metaphors like these seem too anthropomorphic and imply that anti-Semitism is a unified concept rather than a multifaceted phenomenon that is constantly morphing recombining and adapting to fit contemporary circumstances. On the other hand, in one important aspect, the fighting metaphor is useful. It does suggest that we can devise strategies against it, which has the psychological appeal of implying that we can do something about it. It suggests that when it comes to finding countermeasures against anti-Semitism, some frontal, some indirect, Strategic thinking is both involved and, I would argue, required. Those of you who know me and are familiar with the kind of work that I initiated at the European Institute for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism know that the need for coherent strategic initiatives against anti-Semitism are indispensable and, unfortunately, a much overlooked field of inquiry. So let's start with first principles. If we begin with the assumption that interventions are a good thing, and by good I include the idea of efficacious, then it is equally essential that we need to look at what works. And this is what I want to do here today, to use Britain or the UK as a test case, as an example of where interventions have been carried out and to offer some frameworks for evaluating how they've worked with various degrees of success. I recognize there's a certain iffy quality to using the term degrees of success, when it comes to conventional perceptions of anti-Semitism. For most casual observers, anti-Semitism in the UK hovers somewhere between the endemic and the rampant. Indeed, I sometimes feel that just by putting the two words anti-Semitism and UK together in opposition, I run the risk of reinforcing the conventional wisdom that in Britain, the two terms are coterminous. Even before Sean Paris made his now famous remarks to Benny Morris, that there is, a, there is a growing perception that Britain is an anti-Semitic country, reinforced by popular responses to the writings of Melanie Phillips, Anthony Julius, Dennis McShane, and others. For sociological and linguistic reasons, I don't think the formulation can be justified. 
And I agree with Anthony Julius's formulation that he makes in a recent interview in Haaretz. When asked to respond to President Shimon Peres' comments about anti-Semitism, Britain Julius responded, it is patently true that there has been a significant and complicated element of anti-Semitism, element of anti-Semitism in English attitudes towards Jews in relation to Israel. There is also, he said, a tendency among the Anglo-Jewish establishment to deny it out and out of this <clears throat> so out of desire to fit in with a larger political establishment. But like every judgment that in that two-sentence soundbite, he said, Harris gets it wrong, or rather partly wrong. To him, I would say, yes, there is anti-Semitism, but British attitudes and actions cannot be understood only in that prison. Now, here's the problem. If a country is inherently anti-Semitic, then all interventions are essentially fruitless, at most. And if that's the case, the best that we can do is basically cope or emigrate, which British Jews seem to be doing in increasing numbers. Indeed, in the recent report on British attitudes towards Israel published by the Institute for Jewish Policy Research, 34% describe themselves as likely, quote unquote, or very likely to move to Israel. But for those of us who opt to stay and roll up their sleeves, and logic dictates on a realistic and philosophical level, that there are certain things that can be done to curtail it, turn it back, stop it, or somehow even neutralize it. With that in mind, I'd like to posit that there are four, that there are interventions that we can evaluate in terms of UK efforts. I propose that there are four broad areas of intervention. Legal, political, educational, and cultural. Or to phrase it differently, there are four means or tools that can be used to contain, curtail, or at best of scenarios, neutralize anti-Semitism and its impact. Law, politics, education, culture. Admit admittedly, this is a functionalist approach, and consequently, there are basic questions that need to be asked. How does one measure the impact of anti-Semitism and by the same token, quantify whether intervention A has been effective in reducing it as opposed to intervention B. Secondly, how does one measure, let alone qualify, quantify success? There are areas required, these are areas requiring future research and scientific precision, and may, on some level, touch on the field of social psychology. I'm now thinking about the field of prejudice reduction and other cognitive therapy techniques which, as an aside, my own preliminary research reveals is a glaringly unexplored area of independent research. But returning to our theme, one of the four, of the four interventions, legal, political, educational, and culture, is helpful to distinguish between soft and hard interventions. Soft interventions are interventions which are calibrated to the expressions of anti-Semitism of a less threatening variety. Under this category, which may be determined by both objective and subjective criteria, we can subsume casual, social, genteel, commonplace, and cultural expressions all the way down, all the way to those which may reflect varying degrees of what could be described as right-wing cant or non-ideological hard-left stereotypes. One of the hallmarks of this level of anti-Semitism is it contains echoes or resonances of Jewish conspiracy or, or classic anti-Semitic tropes, but they are not deemed to be so virulent or embedded that a person who holds them cannot change or his or her mind. This is a critical component. Hence, the typical educational intervention operates from the philosophical principle that an indeterminate but somehow sufficient no knowledge of understanding of, and here the subject gets tricky, <clears throat> Uh, what piece of knowledge, what knowledge trajectory can we try to relate that will somehow make people see the problem or danger of anti-Semitism? Do we set out to explain the nature of anti-Semitism, the history of anti-Semitism, the symbolism and hurtfulness of anti-Semitism, or do we approach things from a more elevated level and seek to impart Jewish knowledge? What issues can we take, after all, that will impart just the right amount of information and understanding that will create a kind of tipping point inside a person's head whereby they won't want to speak, behave, act in a such massively ignorant way. In the UK, a variety of educational efforts exist that either directly or indirectly address anti-Semitism. Some, like the previously mentioned publication of the Community Securities Trust Anti-Semitism Report, 
clearly designed to educate both the Jewish and non-Jewish public to the, op and to the objective and measurable extent to which anti-Semitism is manifesting itself during a 12-month period. These reports have been published for 20, close to 20 years, and it could be argued, based on their utility for the media, and for the police, government, as well as general readers, the role has played has been immense. Recently, CST's new annual report on anti-Semitic discourse, while only begun in 2008, plays an even more explicitly educational role, primarily because its subject matter, in effect, the presence of anti-Semitic ideas, themes, and <clears throat> And what I referred to in a previous context as topoi or stereotypes requires more explication than incidents. So in other words, in order to identify an anti-Semitic trope, you need to know something about the structure and logic of anti-Semitic ideas. In addition, CST published a handbook which is distributed to campuses throughout the UK in order to address a growing global phenomena of campus-based anti-Semitism often combined with the vilification and demonization of Israel. This booklet called A Student's Guide to Anti-Semitism on Campus is specifically geared toward providing students with a detailed and practical compendium of what could be called students' legal rights vis-a-vis anti-Semitism. While this publication overlaps with the legal intervention category, because of its rich informational nature, I think its role is really more clearly educational. Other educational interventions in the UK are bound are referred to the Holocaust Education Trust, interfaith efforts such as Three Faith Forum, Council of Christians and Jews, Olive Olive, Board of Deputies, and so on and so forth. Now comes cultural interventions. By cultural interventions, I seek to assume those efforts to define, call out, explain, and identify, and shame anti-Semitism, whether by deed or discourse, that can't conveniently be placed in the, in the other rubric. Insofar as writers, be they journalists, academics, artists, analysts, pundits, editors, columnists, bloggers, contribute to a writing and reading culture, okay, or what might be glibly called the intellectual sector, the term culture has merit. As a synonym for what could be called high culture of the arts, it doesn't, at least not in the context of anti-Semitism. Thus, when a writer such as Howard Jacobson, in his latest satirical novel, the Finkler question, or in his weekly columns he writes for The Independent, <clears throat> on the one end of the serious scale, all the way down to Anthony Julius, whose monumental trials of the diaspora covering centuries of English anti-Semitism, when he refers to his work, as he did in an interview I had with the Jerusalem Report, as an intervention, I think it's important to take that notion seriously. By the same token, when a BBC program called Who Do You Think You Are? follows celebrities or public personae as they retrace their roots, in many cases, Jewish ones. In one case, Jerry Springer <clears throat> went all the way back in, 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 in this journey to pre-Hitler Germany before cultural anti-Semitism turned political. While it may be stretching the notion of an intervention somewhat, by the same token, if it serves to broaden understanding of anti-Jewish prejudice, it is an explicitly, it is, insofar as it's explicitly non-didactic, therefore differentiating it from educational interventions. Also, in terms of culture, we need to examine the role of comedy. What role does comedy play in detoxifying hatred or draining anti-Jewish prejudice of some of its venom? In particular, I've been thinking of the film The Infidel, about a Muslim who discovers, in fact, he's Jewish. It's actually quite funny. By comedian and writer David Badil who in a recent interview, just prior to the release of the DVD, in other words, you can get it, uh, <clears throat> from Amazon or whatever, laughter, he says, can be used as a weapon, and it can be used to pre preserve bullies, but much more often, it's healing. It's a bonding action. Laughter can bring us together, not pull us apart, and I believe that quality is, much, is most useful when applied to delicate and challenging areas, and that's where it's most important. Educational, cultural, now comes legal. If educational and cultural interventions against anti-Semitism are of the soft variety, this brings us to the two hard interventions, <clears throat> those which use law or what could be called the legal process or legislative process to seek remedies or antidotes to the phenomenon, those which would even more directly face it head on, i.e. in political channels. 
It's the latter two, particularly the political category, of areas where I believe the United Kingdom has distinguished itself in ways that have not received significant analysis or attention. Let's take the idea of legal intervention. First, because in some ways, it's the most familiar for us and for which there are probably more parallels internationally than others. I refer to those for whom over anti-Jewish prejudice or Holocaust denial is an actionable offense. In terms of other legal interventions, the UK is not unique. As in the United States, depending upon the circumstances and the way it's carried out, it may be contributing to the factor as a hate crime, and therefore, in its severest case, it's actionable. <clears throat> There's an entire literature on UK hate crimes, what constitutes hate speech, whether it needs to be accompanied by an action or a deed, whether it violates freedom of speech, under what circumstances, etc. <clears throat> but my interest is not in that level of detail. The important thing this discussion is that an important index is how seriously anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic manifestations regarded on the league level can be seen by the way in which law enforcement authorities such as Scotland and Yard regard the work of the Community Security Trust. In other words, both CST and the Metropolitan Police, as well as the constabulary throughout the UK, <clears throat> have a sophisticated means of identifying and recording anti-Semitic incidences and share this information. CST, in other words, is, is acting on a legal intervention uh, as a part of the legal intervention component. Part of the seriousness with which the UK, and in particular the Labour government, has traditionally viewed anti-Semitism stems from the way that racist violence was thrust into the public and private and, and pu public policy agenda in the wake of the inquiry of the death of Stephen Lawrence. For more than a decade, the Labour-led government had taken the view that the legislation against racially motivated violence is a key form of intervention against crime and disorder. As it happens, in this field of research, my close friend and colleague Paul Gansky has investigated and explored in some depth, not the least of which is a monograph he published <coughs> called Understanding and Addressing the Nazi Guard, Intervening Against Anti-Semitic Discourse, is commissioned by the UK's Department of Communities and Local Government. In addition, for the last two years, CST has, has commenced the publication of what could be considered a more subtle and hard to define manifestations, namely anti-Semitic discourse. While not of unique coinage, the very flagging of anti-Semitic discourse as an area possibly in need of legislative remedies in the UK emerged with the publication of the all-party parliamentary inquiry into anti-Semitism in 2005. So it's important to acknowledge that the very coinage of a term, a phrase, such as uh, anti-Semitic discourse, in a way, is a kind of intellectual or cognitive intervention. By calling something an anti-Semitic discourse, one creates a category that is both conceptually useful and, and one step removed from the notion of motivation. You can say, in other words, somebody is echoing anti-Semitic themes or stereotypes in your conversation with somebody without necessarily thinking that you are, or having the other person think that you are actually talking about what they are motivated by, or, or that you're peering into their soul. <clears throat> As other scholars have pointed out, the efficacy of Holocaust denial legislation is spotty at best, especially in countries where the law becomes a target of repeated legal challenges. And this brings us to the fourth and perhaps most universally understood form of, of intervention, which I refer to under the category of political. Of all the four types, this is the one with which we are arguably the most familiar. Political interventions can take the form of everything from formal declarations by government and international bodies, right down to behind closed doors and words or messages conveyed by a host of quote unquote special advisors, back channel conduits, as I guarantee were utilized when Prime Minister David Cameron chose to use the unfortunate term prison camp to refer to the quality of life in Gaza during his visit to Turkey earlier this month. <clears throat> Globally, the number and variety of political interventions against anti-Semitism are manifold. Each needs to be examined in its own right. Indeed, the subject itself is worthy of a monogram. In the UK, as Gil has mentioned, the two political interventions that have generated some interest across the pond are the academic boycott of Israel, which is part of the larger boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS movement, and the all-party parliamentary inquiry into anti-Semitism. Now, this is curious because I don't think it's got the kind of publicity 
they deserved in the United States. In terms of the academic boycott, the test case, I believe, that served as an exemplar of political intervention was the Stop the Boycott Initiative, a coordinated effort which brought together a coalition of mainstream Jewish organizations, including the Board of Deputies of British Jews, the Jewish Leadership Council, the Community Security Trust, the Academic Friends of Israel, Labor and Conservative and Liberal Democratic Friends of Israel, the Engage website, which helped him lead the charge, and coordinated by the British Israel Communications and Media Center, chaired by the high media profile Melvin Bragg, Chancellor of Leeds University in Anjou. Okay, so what you had really was a, you had a concerted effort, people came together, and then what happened? Using politically sophisticated and strategically interlocking parts, including full page advertisements. Now, let me tell you something the British Jewish community doesn't do full page ads, they just don't do it. They don't put their head above the parapet. It's not like ADL, it's not like the United States, full page ads by the American Jewish community telling you exactly where they stand on a particular issue. It's just not done. Okay? So it was mega that this happened in the UK. And, and the ads were quite sophisticated. Because they, they focused on academic freedom, British values of fair prey, and never once used the term anti-Semitism. And they took some flack for that because they, no, it should be. You mentioned anti Semitic, because the white country is anti Semitic. We said, no, we need a broad coalition. We're not going to mention anti Semitism because it may be a party anti Semitic, but the fact of the matter is, we want allies. And so we're going to get allies. We're going to get, we're going to get Melvin Bragg on board. We're going to get all, and, 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 and pay attention. The anti boycott, and now listen, <clears throat> uh, right. The anti boycott message of the campaign was endorsed by a majority of UK newspapers including The Guardian and The Independent, and it was amplified by high-profile lobbying of university chancellors and given pro bono legal uh, help from UK attorney Anthony Julius and the American trial attorney Alan Dershowitz. Polit political in its, in its broader public reach, insofar as it was carried out by the wider public space and involved in the knowledge and understanding and ability to navigate and make strategic interventions, to the appropriate openings in the hierarchy and structure of the university and college's union, the UC boycott call eventually collapsed when the union's lawyers conceded that enacting the boycott would violate UK's discrimination laws. Now, let me just tell you that <clears throat> suddenly it stopped. And I don't think anybody really got concerned. It's justified. But I would equally argue that for many of our colleagues, friends, and associates who don't have the luxury of coming to international conclaves on anti-Semitism, that part of that same concern stems from an inability to properly analyze and even grade the danger levels of various forms of anti-Semitism and to recognize, in principle and in practice, that calibrated interventions can and do work. Measuring their success and efficacy, as well as in differentiating between cultures and countries. And I just heard the phrase geographic, what was it? Uh, REA, what was your term? Uh, locational. Locational. Locational what? Anti-Semitism. Locational anti-Semitism. In other words, it varies from location to, to location. Measuring their success and efficacy, as well as differentiating between cultures and countries, is another matter altogether. It is a field of inquiry that is in need of urgent attention and further research if we are able, or we are able to plot strategies against it. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not going to re repeat <laughs> some of the stuff that uh, we've heard up to now because uh, I agree with Obviously, most of the analysis is actually factually correct. Um, but I want to talk, I mean, the session itself, you know, I'm Barry Carsman, um, uh, in case anybody doesn't know, I haven't looked at their program. This session is supposed to deal with the, I think, with the relationship between analysis and action. That's, that's what this is about. Um, and to some extent, we're talking about reversing what is perceived to be a kind of historically or traditionally defensive posture of Anglo jury and try to change it, I would suggest, to go on the, on the uh, offensive against what is perceived as a, a new bout of anti-Semitism in the UK. Um, now, wh why, is, why is Britain important? Right? Why is Judeophobia um, not just a local problem? Well, one of the facts is, and, and it's quite important 
to realize this is that anti-Semitism in Britain has worldwide global impact on Israel, through the um, through Britain's location in the European Union, but above all, perhaps, because Britain is, and London especially, is the kind of historic, cultural, and media capital of the English-speaking world. Britain has the second, after the United States, the second largest number of foreign students. Right? Large numbers of, of students from Africa and Asia go to Britain to be educated. Um, Americans, it is the largest location for semester or year abroad for American <coughs> students. Think of all the Rhodes Scholars who will take leadership positions in the American society eventually, who are exposed to at least a year in the anti-Zionist uh, atmosphere of Oxford today. <clears throat> so London, of course, is an important location um, for a lot of anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic activity. Now, the enemy, and I'll use that term quite clearly, realizes. That is why they have made such an important investment in Londonistan. That term, Londonistan, is a correct assessment of what has gone on. They recognize that it's an important location for their cultural, political war, which is, has a global strategy. Now, that's, that's the importance of why if you put this in a context, why it's important. Now, one of the consequences, so there's two levels to this. One is the international, and then there's the, the interest of the, in, of the Jews living in Britain, right? Now, it could be that those interests might clash on occasion. And that's one of the issues we haven't actually discussed here. But I would suggest that, you know, the publication of anti is an authoritative book on British anti-Semitism. The likely the reaction is would be an acceptance that the well called documented what he calls inventiveness of British anti-Semitism, the problem will be will always be with us, will be, you know, accepted. Uh, my years of involvement in um, communal defense and academic study, which began actually you know, in 1974, unfortunately I have to say, um, leads me to predict that the community's reaction um, will be at the individual and collective level which accepting that this prevailing situation is inevitable. Um, and uh, they'll con continue what I would see existing policies, which are you know, very good tactically, but as we've heard from Winston and uh, from Gill, um, but what, what, what Gill has suggested, and uh, I would also second it, is that they're good on the tactics, but they're not good on the strategy. And anybody who has a military kind of stuff, I don't want to be clouds of it, but, but you know, there's a difference between operations, tactics, and strategy. Right? You can win battles and lose the war. Um, the, the, the kind of community, the prevailing situation is, is a defensive posture. It's a holding action against hostile forces. Um, the results and over as we've heard on, on the Community Security Trust, individual legal protections under the Race Relations Act. Um, the issue of group defamation, the image of the Jewish society, the legitimacy of Zionism has not and will not be adequately addressed by this strategy. Um, I'm going to suggest that, the, that, that, in fact, the British have to look, I'm not going to provide you all the, all the <coughs> mechanisms now, but they will have to go into a proactive policy as required if British Jewry is to survive as, as, as a self-respecting and viable community. Um, and we've heard that the, you know, I've done demographics of this kind of, of, the, of the Jewish community in doing that of the United States in the last 30 years, um, and it has seen a 40% reduction in its population. The fact that, it's, to me, it's a remarkable, uh, an amazing um, finding that 34% of the under 40 say it's fairly likely or very likely that they uh, will live in Israel for an established Jewish Western community, which is not uh, suffering from economic dislocation. It's an amazing admission, right? Whatever they say on other things, that actually is, is I think, very revealing. Um, and since, the, you know, the, the Jewish uh, response to anti-Semitism also, I think, um, over this period has suffered from a bit of historical amnesia. As a result, the previous proactive strategies have been forgotten. Um, when I went in, first met in the Board of Deputies as research director in 74, you had the last of the, of the kind of World War II generation, the 
free group of people who fought Mosley and things like that. But what they had at that time was a very um, good um, politically or political activism with local people who were very much on the ground. It wasn't a Stadtland approach, right? In fact, the Stadtland approach is not even correct today. Stadtland was, 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 is the concept that communal leadership um, should rely on influential and political, politically connected Jews. But if you look at the leadership of British Jewry, those are not the people who are in control. So what you have is a loss of political self affair, a failure to actively consider mobilization in certain ways, a lack of any consideration of, of coalition building, um, which would, might make their enemies less, more cautious or less triumphalist, uh, and keep them on the back foot, and to some extent tone down the rhetoric its activities against the community. Now, British Jewish uh, jury finds coalition building, I think, difficult, because it has no vision of it, what its place, role, and or unique contribution to British society should be. If you are a diaspora community, yeah, you have to have some idea of what, what, what you are and, and, and who you are. There's a collective failure of imagination to see the possibilities of the moment, um, the community's lack of self-awareness, one would suggest sense of uh, solidarity and, and sometimes self-esteem, is of course due to an educational deficit. The people I dealt with in the 1970s who never went to university were much more aware of Jewish history, they were much better educated politically, than the leadership to that. You are basically umpirates. That's the only thing you can say. Ignoramuses, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, of various descriptions. It's the only way one has to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, tell the truth to power to some extent. So they think, you know, the, the leadership doesn't even know, you know, what, what the role was of, of not, neither the, the Jewish youngsters or the kind of Moses Montefiore that one of thing. Moses Montefiore, at least, put his money where his mouth was, he, and actually, as an elderly man, went off in a carriage to speak to the Sultan, to go to the Tsar. He actually did something. I mean, uh, he, he, you know, to deal with Damascus blood libels, the pogroms, I said. Few leaders today are actually willing to do that. I don't see them using their wealth or their social capital in pursuit of justice. So, or to prevent their people being maligned. I mean, it was very, very difficult for British Jewry um, to raise the money to defend Deborah Lipstadt. And I'm going to talk about that whole issue of, of, of the, libel, the libel case. But that was, in, you know, in American money that had to come in to actually defend Deborah in the courts on, uh, against Irving, right? And if you can't fight David Irving, who the hell are you going to fight? He's a classic 1930s by anti semite you know? You're not going to do much against the jihadists if you can't have and, you know, the last quarter. Um, you know, the one exception to this is, is, of course, this campus scene that we, we refer to. The Union of Jewish Students. Activist post, immersed itself in student politics, done a very good job, and actually is a model of coalition uh, building strategy. Um, why this success is not emulated, national political scene, has always been to me a, a, a puzzle. Um, part of it is historical ignorance and political inertia, and to some extent, naivety. And the fact that that UJS leadership actually is part of that immigration. So, if you look at most of the leaders, um, uh, my daughter was on the executive of the, of the uh, National Union of Students a few years ago. Most of the people who were in, in UJS, you know, the national leader, most of that student leadership today is in Canada, the United States, and in, in Israel. So, I mean, it's, it's a very good example of, of, the, of the loss of talent. Um, but it's, you know, which, which creates this, this cycle of, of decline. Now, the, the nexus of relationship between organizational structure, community leadership, collective morale, and the ability to deal with external threats like uh, anti-Semitism was the focus of something I tried to do with JPR, my short stem back to Britain between 1999 and 2005, the Community of Communities Report. Um, this document made it clear that only a kind of self-aware Jewish, confident Jewish community that adopted a kind of holistic approach could meet the challenges of the 21st century, and particularly the threat from new types of anti-Semitism, opposing as anti-Zionism. Um, so what's unique about the situation in the UK, particularly more so than, than some other countries? Now, anti-Semites in, 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 in Britain, as everywhere else, they create anti-Semitism because it serves their personal, their psychological, 
political needs, as you know, as well as being hapers and opportunists. And so the result is that at the moment, as we know, is a kind of temporary, as you heard from Chavez, is a great woman, it seems to be the most amazing the ability to create this brown, red, green uh, coalition. Uh, but you see echoes of that everywhere. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, as regards the, the, the far right and the, and, and, and the Islamists, there's not much British jury could do about that. They're not, they haven't really got the resources or anything. That's worldwide struggle probably had to be led by the United States and, and Israel. Um, they also, of course, as, as Gil has pointed out, a law and order and security problem for the state, and that's where it has to, that, that's where that, those particular problems have to be transferred. A, low, a small voluntaristic community cannot deal with those kinds of state-sponsored terrorism, etc. Um, the danger, however, is, is, is that um, is, is perhaps this liberal left kind of anti-Semitism, which is even more un uh, opportunistic. Um, the danger is uh, when these kind of anti-Semitic top oil that are put out in, in the media become accepted and accepted the discourse, they create a trend which then affects the mainstream of society. And when one's beginning to see these things um, adopted in mainstream society. And in the last uh, four or five years, what was regarded as a fringe and was in the Guardian is now moved into this kind of Daily Telegraph kind of people. Um, now, one of the, um, I guess, issues that we have to face is that um, in Britain, and uh, it's probably not probably undiplomatic of me to say this, is the complete com combating the new anti-Semitism of this kind of uh, cultural, political angle. There is, the, the community is compromised, what we might would call by renegade Jews, I guess, uh, as in the old USSR. Um, comrades anxious to ingratiate themselves and gain standing or career and preferment as good Jews by denouncing other Jews, um, Judaism and Israel. Now they often, as we, often lead the boycotts and the demos against Israel. They encourage the media to sort their political, very, very clever at using the Holocaust card, speaking that they've got some great, great uncle somewhere who died in Auschwitz or something, and that gives them the moral authority to you know, last, you know, whatever Jewish organization they like. Unfortunately, um, these kind of Jews believe that in order to carry favor of the powers that be on the campus or in the editorial office, um, they have to conform to prevailing fashion. And of course, this is, this is, a, this is a, a circular syndrome. The more, the worse the, the McCarthyite atmosphere becomes, the more the people, there's a need for people to, to do this. Um, so it leads to behavior, of course, reminiscent in some cases of a farcical nature, like Stalinist show trials, where individuals self-flagellate themselves and admit to preposterous tales of guilt. Um, this McCarthyite atmosphere is, creates a situation where Jews need to denounce other Jews uh, for being too loyal to the Jewish people. Um, a climate of oppression, which you know, you've got a Jewish version of Uncle Tom and of Uncle Mo, you know, this sort of figure, the good, happy, anxious Jew, ready to join any demonstration against Israel, sign any petition, uh, lambasting uh, the government of Israel or Zionist organizations, are rushing to get on the TV to narrate documentaries, in effect, um, supporting agitprop of those who want to kill other Jews, uh, or destroy those bad Jews, anyway. Um, so then, you know, the, what do you do with it? You know, Jews for everybody else's country, right or wrong, kind of okay. Now, one of the issues, one of the, one of the responses, is in these people, it's been done here, self-hating Jews. Um, many of these Jews are undoubtedly stuck in the 1930s time war, and they're in denial. Um, unless their Arab and radical Euro European friends actually donned the brown shirt and the swastika armband and jackboots, of course, the swastika on the star of those on the, on the uh, Israeli flag does not count, um, they refuse to recognize that any of the people around have an actual unanimous against Jews per se, uh, or Judaism, or, or Jewish people. Um, you know, for the kind of independent Jewish voices constituency, and, and those are kinds of folks, and, and some of you find that too moderate view. Um, rabid anti-Semitism is a careerist and ideological position. Um, it's not a psychological pathology, however. It's wrong, it's inaccurate, self-defeating to call such people self-hating Jews. I believe they have career, clear careerist reasons for doing this in an increasingly McCarthyite atmosphere. 
If it's not a psychological uh, pathology, therefore it's a rationalist response to a situation where utopian idealism is hegemonic. And that, I think, is, is, is crucial. So it's important that these kind of renegades are, are delegitimized. I don't know how you, I mean, the, the, the way this phenomenon can be defeated before it becomes widespread, but there's many more uh, Jews, um, is to realize that it's a problem. Uh, and that and the, the Jewish community, to some extent, is the first target of any education that uh, Winston is talking about. You have to secure your base before you can actually go out and argue with the wider society and convince your enemies to be you know, slightly nicer to you. Um, so we have to educate the Jewish community and the friends and, and relatives of many of these uh, mis what I would call renegades um, by offering explanations of their behavior and motivations as well as historical and political arguments that undermine those kinds of ideological positions. Now, obviously I have made an analogy and reference to the USSR and that's no accident. To understand a lot of, of, of the thinking of Britain, especially of people who are 1968 generation who now in, in, in poor positions in government, and, you know, uh, pre-retirement years, as it were, you have to understand the Marxian or Marxist nature of most of this. And, and anti-Semitism historically has been a surrogate for anti-capitalism. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it was a Nazi and a, and a communist uh, idea. Um, I'll give you an example. J. Hobson's book, Anti-Imperialism, anti um, which was written in 1901 at the time of the South African War, was actually, Glennon records it, it's one of his favorite books, one of the most motivated books. Now, when I was in Africa teaching um, 20 years ago, I remember going to the University of Zambia in Lusaka, and Foreign Languages Publishing House in Moscow had donated 15 copies. In fact, it was one of the largest, the, 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 the book with the largest number in their library. 15 copies of Hobson's Imperialism there in this, in this new African uh, university library. Didn't have many other books either. Um, so, you know, th this, is, this is important stuff. Um, and yet we have to remember the idealism of the, of the Soviet Union and, and <laughs> all the Jews who believed in the Soviet Union. The USSR was the first country to ban anti-Semitism and make it a legal offense, ban the 25, legal offense under the 37 Constitution. Right? Um, so that is the root. Stalin, Uncle Joe, loved <coughs> euphemisms, rootless cosmopolitans, Zionists. The KGB, the NKVD, knew who he meant when it, you know, who should go to the gulags. Um, but the the, the, this, this, the, the fact that, that, that in the Soviet Union it was illegal to be anti-Semitic and you couldn't use the word Jew or afraid as, as a form of attack on Jews meant that that's why they began, they, the, the Zionism, the concept of Zionist was, was used in the 30s, by the, in, in 37, 38, began in, in the Soviet Union, anti-Zionism. Those of us, and again when I was in the 70s, I was involved in the Soviet jury campaign, we already knew that it was going back to the 50s to the doctor's plot in 48 and things like that. An anti-Zionist campaign, which was a client down on the Jews of the Soviet Union, always began with an article in Sovietische Heimat, which is the CP, the, Jew, you know, the CP's Yiddish magazine or journal, Communist Party, for those who are not aware of what CP is. Um, you know, it, it always denounced Jewish social chauvinism or bourgeois to Soviet activity. That's what it is. Now, these are the echoes that you hear on the campus of Britain. It's ridiculous that nobody at this conference has talked about it. I know it's nice to talk about this, the law, and jihad, and the rest of it, but that is important as well, this whole history which hasn't been mentioned um, here. So we have to touch about the politics and history of the Jewish people. Lionel Cochin's history of Jews, Russia, and Soviet Union, should be read by every <laughs> Jewish leader and activist. You can't understand what's going on unless you have this background. Um, the community needs to make you know, these intellectual resources available. Um, Wisniewski's book, A Legal Obsession, uh, A Lethal Obsession, is not available, this is where it becomes interesting, is not available in British bookstores. Why is it not available? Because of Britain's defamation of libel laws. Increasingly, um, the, the, the anti-pro-Jewish, pro-Zionist, 
activities are affected by warfare as war as censorship. But any or you know, you don't have to prove. We heard from um, uh, Shimon Samuels this problem of in France that he had of being you know, under this case. I don't know if you know yesterday of defamation against some Hezbollah or whatever it was outfit uh, in France, which you know, cost a hundred thousand euros to defend. Um, so, but, but this this whole question of Britain's defamation libel laws is it, it's crucial to understand that American writers are now threatened by this, and American publishers who want to sell in Britain and the Commonwealth uh, won't bring out books because you know, I don't want to talk about the publishing industry and its deals of how 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 you know money is made by publishers, but they don't want to lose that market, and that's why Britain is important. The English-speaking world is is divided into two markets, publishing wise. United States and Canada, and then in Britain and the rest of the English speaking world. Don't understand that, you don't understand why the bookshelves are heavily, increasingly heavily stacked by anti Zionist um, books without any adequate reply because of this tactic. We also have the, you know, the, so there's a whole question. Now, looking at this whole question of, of higher education in the, in, in the UK from the, from the local point of view. One of the issues there, although know, the UJS is a very good group, it's usually led by engineers and doctors and medical students and people like that. Because you have to understand that in Britain, in most parts of Europe, there is no liberal arts higher, ed higher education system. There's no general education. It's a form of specialist education. You cannot do what you do in the United States, but you can take people from the vet school and they have to do some kind of course in languages and give them you know, a little bit of semester of Hebrew or Holocaust studies and anything doesn't fit the, the, the model, um, the, those types of programs. There's no way of getting, well, Jewish studies would be taken as Oxford, I was associated a little bit, but there's, there's four students doing Jewish studies as an undergraduate at the moment, because that's a specialism, right? Well, they have hundreds of Jewish students are doing physics and French and this and that's what else. They will never be exposed to any course in Jewish studies. So that's important. So what does that mean? It means you have to have to put, to put a lot of your work or in, into what you might call informal education, adult education, or which, which is the opportunity in Britain we've never heard of, where where last 50 percent of the Jewish students go to uh, Jewish schools. There has to be a very big, big, big um, push to get Zionist and Jewish history, and maybe some even political uh, awareness into the high school curriculum within the Jewish schools. All right, so. One of the um, issues there is that um, also in Britain is that I've seen in the last uh, few decades is something unusual, but I think it's beginning in the United States. Barry Chiswick has already spoken about the decline of the Jewish PhD. But if you look at British universities compared to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, especially 50 years ago, there aren't the great, there aren't the senior uh, Jewish professors that I remember. Um, the proportion, the number, number and proportion of Jewish faculty in British universities has fallen. Um, now that, you know, you could say it's good, bad or different, Jews have gone off to equivalent of Wall Street and made themselves rich and famous that way and other things. But, but it, um, it has an effect. It means that, uh, that um, there aren't, there's been many moderate Jewish academics, as we see what I would call it, in, in this room here from Britain. Um, probably most of the minyan that exists here. In the social sciences and humanities. Um, and and what, you, what the community has done is got a handful of poorly endowed placed uh, interventions in, in British academia without the, without, with no strategic thinking that actually you should take, you get one cr critical location and really stack it so it becomes a powerhouse of Jewish uh, uh, academic uh, Israel studies, etc. Um, now that's important <laughs> because of the fact that the Muslims and Arabs have had a takeover of many British universities. Um, if you, the number of, you know, it's, it, Oxford has its Saeed chair in, in, in the School of Business, right? It's a Syri wealthy Syrian that bought out the business school in, in, in Oxford. Um, international relations departments, the Middle East departments, all of them now are heavily funded. British universities are, are setting up 
substations uh, or whatever you want to call it, sub campuses in the Emirates, many Muslim countries. There's a you know the the, the Arab, the Arab uh, Muslim uh, uh, endowment of chairs, and research centres is 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 is, is well documented. And one of the things you one has to face, and probably actually announced, is that many academics in Britain are bought and paid for. And you know that's that's a reality. And somebody has to say that. Um, now I don't want to sort of you know say that um, that uh, that universities are dangerous. I work in one, um, several. Um, but but we have to accept that advanced kind of <laughs> education in, in the social sciences and humanities in the 21st century produces social critics and, and uh, relativism uh, or, or, is, or those kind of concepts are, are prominent. Um, and, and, and academics indulge in critical thinking. They're not doers, but historically they tend to admire energetic doers. Um, change they can believe in. Um, the record is such that, that um, academics and intelligentsia have been um, supporters of many of the things that we're talking about. Um, it, you know, Julian Bender, which plays on their quote, written in 27, accused the, the intellectuals and the universities in France of Germany of being apologists for crass nationalism, warmongering racism, the fashions of that age between the wars. In 27. Max Reinreich uh, wrote the book, you know, Hitler's Professors in 46, showed that universities weren't friendly to the Jews. That Hitler's Professors, the German academia, was part and parcel of the Nazi movement. And that's where you know, it was. Um, the, the, um, the update of that, of course, is Alan Steinweiss's book, if you're looking at studying the Jew, the scholarly anti Semitism in Nazi Germany. But actually, they invested a lot in Jewish studies. Okay? <laughs> the Nazis put more money into Jewish studies than the Jewish community. <laughs> they wanted to understand their enemy, the Jews didn't really want to understand themselves. Um, <laughs> now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that these Middle Eastern studies, political sociology departments, are going in the same kind of direction. Uh, Max, I'm going to quote Ryan right here, scholars prepared, instituted, and blessed the program of vilification, disenfranchisement, dispossession, expatriation, imprisonment, deportation, enslavement, torture. Well, the first half a dozen or so do apply to Israel, and Israel is to that. I'm not to mass murder at all again. So, it's, you know, it's, a, it's not surprising to me that the boycott campaign is not an economic boycott, but it's an academic boycott. That's where it's beginning, right? The Arab boycott was an economic, didn't work. So now there's a new kind of uh, takeover. Delegitimization, humanization, and centered in, 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 in universities. Now, in Britain, it's actually a tradition. I was <laughs> I'm asked to give some guest lectures, assignment lectures at the University of Manchester um, about four or five years ago. It's a nice little number, as they say. It was a of so I actually went to, into the records to find out and I thought it was interesting. What happened in Manchester in January 1933 when Hitler was, was, was elected? Was there any reaction at all? Well, what I found was there was one reaction, which was a Nazi <laughs> takeover of the campus Lutheran church by German students and their friends to celebrate Hitler's victory. Now this was a campus where Hein Weizmann was the professor of chemistry. And it's the second largest Jewish community in Britain. They had about 40,000 Jews at that time. So, you know, that must have been a message for the Jews that, you know, the university might not have been such a, such a wonderful, friendly, friendly territory. So it's this admission of what the realities of the world are that I think is, is part, of, part of what we have to do. And also train the students. You know, you're not actually on friend, necessarily on, on uh, friendly ground. So let me just come along with this, end up with some you know, strategic thinking. Um, I think what Jews have to do is, is, is obviously, and I could go on about the BBC and people like that and, and uh, the Guardian and all these kind of things. But, you know, let me. Where, where, where the Jewish community has really, I mean, what you can get away with, I mean, actually there's a couple of things here which I think are important. Tom Paulin is the BBC's critic and cultural arbiter, at least he was a few years ago. Uh, his record has labeled the, the Israeli army as the Zionist SS. Uh, according to the Cairo Weekly, Al-Akram, 
He incited terrorist killing of Israelis and, and American Jews. He claimed it was a mistranslation from the Arabic. He's still on the BBC. Um, a clear indication of, of the BBC's reputation. This is paid for by Jewish taxpayers' license fees. I once came on to the Jewish community and said, we should, that Jews should actually organize, looking for allies, a boycott, a, a, a you know, sort of a, a, a um, uh, refusal to, to pay the license fee. The BBC's reputation in the Middle East um, you know, is such that the Sunday Times, London Sunday Times, 2003, reported the BBC's Arabic service counts Saddam as a listener. And according to the Jordanian <coughs> sources, he called twice to say appreciated what was said on the BBC. You know, this is it's an amazing situation of how these kind of people have got, you know, and, and, and they actually turn out the BBC no longer feels that it has to support Britain. It's the voice of Britain. It's some kind of globalised kind of thing that it no, no longer has to support British policy. Hateful by the British taxpayers, but doesn't have any loyalty. It's, kind of, it's, got, it's, it's a globalised, it's got its own global um, uh, loyalty to third world is what I say. Um, so what should the Jews do? I think they sometimes have to be a bit more articulate when they're wrong and hurt. Um, they need a strategy of, uh, of more to response. They need the bubble of intellectual tools to hear back. Um, they need to identify the gradations of prejudice, as, as, as both uh, my colleagues here have suggested. Perhaps use the term Judeophobia more than, than anti-Semitism. Um, build coalitions without other friends and groups, especially. I think that one of the things about British Jewry is a classic case of Am Levadad Yishkar. People dwell in the world. They do not see themselves as, as, as looking for friends to, to, to mobilize on, you know, in, on their occasion. Um, and they have to you know, look for people, I guess, who buy the Jewish narrative. And that would be people appreciate the, the Jewish economic, social success and achievement. People who like winners rather than people who quench and, and, and uh, are losers. Um, people who will, um, who, who see that, you know, it's a democracy flourishing, difficult, hostile Middle East. People who appreciate, you know, advances in agriculture, medicine, all those kind of things. I guess to some extent, I'm not terribly religious myself, the fact is that they probably need people who believe that there's going to God acts in history, I guess. Um, respect at least and know the, the, the Hebrew Bible, for whom the term promised land is not a, a phrase they've never heard about. Um, and that's a small demographic in Britain. One of the problems of Britain has been the collapse of, of, of Protestant Christianity. The Anglo Protestant tradition you had in Britain balance. You had all these anti Semites, we've heard about them already, but you had a strong restorationist. As you have I mean, sort of an Anglo Protestant restorationist tradition, which is echoed now only in the you know, Middle East, southern evangelical America. But you know, Gentile Zionists were very, very important in, in, uh, in fact, the, the Zionist movement and, and its political work um, in the early days uh, of, in, in fact, establishing Israel. You know, all the windows of the world, all these kinds of folks, very, very important. Um, so I think that that, that is a real realization uh, uh, is, is, uh, is, is important. And I, and I think perhaps that, that um, one could, I mean, there are two strategies, I guess. One is that um, you, 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 you give very rational kinds of, of explanations um, to this kind of, uh, to the problems you have. You try and argue um, intellectually with, 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 the, uh, with this and um, and uh, or you decide um, to take a, a much more kind of cynical, um, opportunistic response. That you join up with anybody who doesn't like Muslims, anybody who doesn't like, who you know, run populist campaigns and things like that. Now, these, are, these are political decisions, but the fact that nobody ever thinks about you know, what is the best strategy at the moment? How, how bad is the danger, right? Is the is physical danger more, more I mean, is, is it more dangerous for the Jews, the physical danger? Is it better to undermine what we might call Western liberalism and some democratic values in, the, in, in, in this battle or not? But you have to, there, there's no thinking to decide what those political, what, what are the options on the table? For the, for, Jewish, for, the, for the Jewish people, the Jewish community in Britain. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, moment 
and uh, we will see if Weizmann or Jabotinsky's kind of methods will, will, will win. Um, I am also testing the uh, little me uh, uh, um, response. And, and I would make that point because, although it sounds possible, one of the reasons for the way CST is organized, and I go back, I worked there when the Defense Department um, uh, moved the CSO off the CST, um, and I remember that. One of the reasons why the CST exists in the way it does and the way it is to discipline the Jewish community and keep lots of people within the and the community in, within within the community and then and make sure that there's no Kahanis type the Jewish response in Britain. Thank you. We have any time left for questions? <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, uh, I really appreciated learning a lot about the UK problems dealing with anti-Semitism in America. Uh, I trust that. Uh, I hope that uh, some of these problems uh, are both regional levels in the United States. But what does that mean? Regional levels in the United States. But my main question is, you say that the Jewish community is organized around the Holocaust, and that there's a lot of Jewish people who are in the Holocaust. How do you, all of you, could respond to this? How do you create a balance between the, uh, whether you're on a, in the campus or in a larger uh, community, uh, between Jewish sectarian approaches to combating anti-Semitism and more pluralistic approaches? Uh, what's, what's the best way to do this? What's the best strategy uh, in balancing the, the two efforts? I think, I think that's a very good question. I don't, I don't know if we've actually looked at uh, and weighed up the options and framed it in that particular way. Um, I think you have to do is you have to go into the campuses themselves, <coughs> see how the Union of Jewish Students and other Jewish organizations are actually doing that. Ask the question: What's worked? What hasn't worked? You know, in terms of combating uh, certain uh, political movements on campus or their actions. Um, I don't know. It's a great question. I, it's simply I, I can't really answer. I don't know about anybody else. The only thing I was thinking of as you. As I, and I, this is off the top, but you know, the, the ad about which was spoken, it was taken out of the papers, for example, in America. They, they would have brought in, if that was the strategy, they would have been able to find non-Jews to get on board. That kind of, and that would have been the strategy to do it, uh, rather than be a parochial kind of approach and leave out the word Jew, or anti-Semitism. Um, and so I think in America, we can reach out more quickly and more effectively to other groups because, and I think uh, Sarah talked about that too, we do have intergroup relations, we have coalitions, we work with coalitions. And I think that's different, dramatically so. Uh, yeah. You know, the whole community relations field in America, yes. in the Jewish community, I don't think it really exists. The, the, the notion, I mean, I'll give you one very personal example. But, um, I've been involved in a group that works with the, with the Presbyterian Church. It's a group that has been meeting now in the last five years to try to work on the issue of divestment. And as you probably, if you follow that detail, at their conference this July, there was a major effort to pass a resolution, a very, very ugly resolution, on divestment. And the key people who opposed that resolution on the floor of their General Assembly were people that I have been involved with for the last five years, including going to Israel with them. Presbyterians. Um, people who got it, who understood that you may, you and I, we may disagree about policy. But divestment is not the strategy. There are ways to deal with those issues. So I think it's a lot of tough work that ultimately can bring fruit be our fruit. That's, a, that's an example where it worked. But it comes back to my point about if you don't know what kind of community you are, what your places in society, etc., you don't really you can't really do a coalition vote because you don't you know there's a variety of choices and, and you can't decide who you're going to go. And, you know, if you're going to go, well, I mean, the Orthodox, I mean, let's take it, the gay community. Well, the Orthodox never wanted to go in with the gay community under any circumstances. 
Even though the gays were the only ones who actually were willing to do something against the Iranians, the Iranians, you know, to say something. The Iranians, and I remember in Wembley Park, I think I remember was, they had, a, they had a meeting in here, a big meeting of the Shiites. And only the gay community was willing to get out there and, and demonstrate what they said. We were, you know, Chief Rabbi thought this was dangerous. You know, well, the Shiites had their, <laughs> you know, he actually probably agreed with them, you know, stunned them up. Um, you know, it, you know <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I what what you what you want to do, you know, what what you're about. I think that's what you're saying. Yes. I just wanted to build on the question of um, different generations as we develop strategies and reach out. There's there's a generation divide even here in this conference. And in terms of our outlook strategies, I'm wondering what kind of thought you've given to that and some of the challenges that, that everybody, the corporate sector, every sector is having a challenge about reaching this next generation. And it goes way beyond creating a Facebook page. And that's, you know, I'm hearing too often from you, oh, just make a Facebook page. And so that's going to tie it up, you know? Well, I mean, I think that's a very good question. I would start by, you know, let's say, doing a survey. Because I know how uh, people of my age 40s, so on and so forth, respond to anti-Semitism. I basically know what kind of goes on in their heads when anti-Semitism comes up, how they think about it, how they respond to it, how they put it into their intellectual universe. I don't know how 18-year-olds, 16-year-olds, or whatever, when confronted with anti-Semitism, what goes on inside their heads. I don't know what kind of thought process they go through. I don't know whether they say, you know, I'm helpless. I don't want to deal with it. I want to bury it. You know, I want to move on. I don't. I, but I want to know. I want to know because, and maybe, maybe their response to it, there are little pieces out of that response and out of that survey and quantifiable analysis. But maybe there are some solutions that we haven't even begun to look at because simply we're locked in a, different, in a generational. So I'm all for it. But that's why you've got to be able to have somebody say, wait a second. The solutions are out there. What we do is to know how to look for them and maybe look at areas that we haven't looked before. That's what science does. It says, OK, where are we going to put the microscope? Where are we going to do our experiments? Well, OK, let's find out. You know, um, the Bronfman Foundation and a number of other foundations looked at the whole question post-2001 uh, post, uh, and Intifada and everything else. What was going on in terms of Israel's image on campus? Right? And they wrote, they, they did a piece of analysis, Frank Lutz did it. It's called Israel in the Age of m and You know, and a lot of people excoriated, I, I, you know, there, there was a lot of debate about it, and, and, and that just sort of dropped from the scene. But, you know, they took it seriously. They said, how is Israel being perceived on campus by this younger generation? And it was done with focus groups, and interesting stuff came out of it. Now, what did they do with it? What did they, how did they actualize those recommendations? I haven't a clue, but we're going to go back and take a look. And it's the same thing. How are you guys processing it? How are you guys dealing with it? What does it make you feel? You know, what does it make you think? What does it, I want to know these things. I really do. And I would, I would love to be able to con conduct that kind of a survey and then say, well, well, what can we take from this? Are there little pieces of strategic interventions that we can actually do? Because you know, so maybe you'll find out, you know what? You know, I've actually had some success dealing with it on a personal level and actually taking my friend, you know, and bringing him to a shul or something. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm grasping. But <clears throat> who knows? You know, that's why I think you have to look at it creatively and say, wait a second, there are answers. Let's just change the spotlight, look around, see what we can do, try to tease some of that information out, analyze it, try to buy some experimental strategies to see if they work. Because it's not, you know, we have to take that attitude. So, great question. So, uh, there's, there's a thought I have that, you know, if, if you're dealing with the identified Jewish young, younger, you, that's really what I think we have to, at least initially, if you can deal with how you deal with the non identified well, that's a different study. So, one of the most interesting things also that I think was mentioned was that it sort of continues my own sense is that. Those who identify Jewishly in the UK, younger people, are really saying, I'm out of here. I have, I, let me tell you one tiny story. Uh, a PA working in Westminster, personal assistant working at Westminster, told me 
in, in an interview, he said, you know, this country's been wonderful to me. The Jewish country's been wonderful to me. I've uh, had wonderful opportunities. I'm advancing very rapidly. I had a great education. I'm about to get married. I'm not religious. I'm about to get married. If this keeps up, I'm out of here. I don't want to stay here. Now, in America, I mean, it'd be a whole, if, if this person were identified Jewishly, their response would be, I mean, I'm in there. You know, they're not going to do this to me. what it's worth. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. Yes. It's not so much a question, just a, a, you know, sort of a, a, a thought question, which is that, you know, I watched my own son's, like, uh, 12, so he's in, he's in, he's, you know, he's in sixth grade. And, and, and there's this generational thing where he, he has friends who have two mommies. He's got friends who have two daddies. And it's nothing. It's a non-issue. Um, you know, it's a non-issue. Racial issues, it's just a non-issue. Mm -hmm. Now, he's younger enough, but in between generations, there's a non-issue. And I think that, that with, the, with the younger generation, from his on to people 18, 20, 25, there's a presumption that we have solved these issues, that we live in a post-prejudicial society. And there's an assumption that this is a post-prejudicial society, and therefore, if there's something like racism of society, it must be justified. That prejudice by itself as a disease has been overcome. I don't know, just a thought. That's what I'm getting from that generation. I am as well. That's good. Huh? I am as well, and it's from uh, my grandchildren here through the constituents in the synagogue trying to get the younger generations involved, to get them to think. Primarily, they're the people that attend the synagogue that are parents of the Bar Bar Mitzvah are there because their parents are still alive, and their parents want them bar and bat mitzvah. As far as being friendly with other people, they don't think in terms of having strictly Jewish friends. It is all over. They think in terms of, I can marry anybody. I don't have to pass this on. There are no problems. I am American, and I pass. Let me just say something about that. I mean, one, one of the issues that I guess I'm getting at, what, what I was trying to point out is the generation that I, that I uh, mentioned, right? was that they had a great sense of, 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 of Jewish solidarity, but also a sense of common destiny, right, as Jews. Now, the interesting thing is the Jews don't have that, maybe today, but everybody, every, what I've seen, <laughs> Of, of the people on the other side that we've been, showing, we've been hearing about, the rest of the Ubar, have a tremendous sense of solidarity. There is no internal criticism. There is a tremendous sense of common destiny. Right? So they're kind of, you know, what, what we're saying is the 21st century world is being beaten by a kind of 19th century world at best. You know, that those, the, the, the kind of, the, the, the kind of um, what do you want to call it, the, the advantages of, 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 of the traditional world, right, can, can offset the, the Economic and technological advances in the 21st century. In the, the, the sense of loyalty that that the Muslims have, I mean, uh, the TV is, is probably an exception, but I don't know. It's probably regarded as the, 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 the disloyal. I guess. Is that um, loyalty or fear? Well, I mean, it's a matter of, of both. I mean, you know, sort of, you know, there's two types of fear. You know, I've got my throat cut, but in the old days, a lot of people, some of those people, why are they, why are they sending the kids to the bar mitzvah? They don't put out the will. You know, I mean, that's a form of fear as well. You know, they'd be disinherited if they don't, you know. So that's, you know, these are all, there's all the other types of social pressure and psychological. But I think you put your finger on it, which I think is quite an important issue for, the, for, for our times. As it were. And our types of liberal kind of, what are we going to call it? Enlightened Jewish people. Sorry. I think what you're describing is, you know, is, is true of any immigrant group who's, who's poor and comes in, they hold together. And then when they make middle class, it all they start assimilating and, and going. I think the big question we have about the Uma is do they want to assimilate like the, the Americans, the Italians, the 
you know, Italians held together, the Irish held together, they were loyal until they moved out of the lower Manhattan and then they started mixing with everybody. And now you were all nuts. But will the Umas do that? Will the Umas do that? Doesn't look like it, does it? But our only concern for them is because they don't like us. I mean, otherwise it would just be another social process. I mean, do we really care about if the Slovaks or the Amish stay together. It's not a real issue. It's not, not a Jewish problem. This particularly is a Jewish problem. You know, because, yes. you know, that's, it's out, we know we have, we have some partial ownership of that problem. It's <laughs> because not just a Jewish problem. Like, well, we have to frame it as a, a, an American, yeah, sure. American problem. Yeah. We just frame it as a Jewish problem, we lose. We have to say, if you're coming to this country, you need to be no, in Bre I'm, We're still in the British session, but it's particularly right. a Jewish well, problem. Right. You can't go to Britain yeah. and have a British experience anymore. You got to you know, look for the British experience. Right. Right. Correct. Uh, Erwin, the data. Yeah, which is, you know, I, I thought your you know, fourfold approach to strategic interventions is very useful in terms of the educational, the cultural, the political, and the legal. But much of the anti Semitism today is itself organized around kind of group anti Semitism. So you've got, you know, from the previous panel, feminist anti Semitism, where you have uh, queers against Israeli. Part that I can go on. You know, I'm sorry, but should your fourfold approach also be somewhat inclusive or have targeted strategic responses or targeted to the specific groups around which the anti Semitism springs from or is organized? In other words, targeting the feminist, etc., etc. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, that, was, that was just sort of corroboration to the offering. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Those are questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. See, I think what you were, you were doing precisely in the international field in terms of, 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 of looking at it within the framework of genocide and genocide, uh, 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 what, what's the word? Um, um, incitement. Incitement mm -hmm. is critical. Putting that as a term, you know, on the map and, and, and using that as a weapon. It's very, very important to have to use that terminology. Jacob. Um, Trying to put together some of the things which Barry was, has been talking about, about the sort of um, uh, uh, attenuation of identity and numbers in Anglo Jewry, uh, together with the attempts at mobilization against anti Semitism, produces a sort of an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable question, which is. Um, to what extent is the mobilization against anti-Semitism not only a mobilization against something which is there, but a mobilization which is intended to um, preserve um, a Jewish identity, Jewish cohesiveness, which is, um, uh, uh, which is being um, eroded both by the um, uh, uh, by the attractions of other countries, Israel and, and North America, and, um, well, I'll grind you a ball there. It's a legitimate question. I mean, I, in some ways, yeah, look, look, there's an opportunism, of, obviously, of organizations, careers of organiza organizations that kind of get on board with this and see it perpetuate themselves or something, kind of, you know, kind of institutional entrepreneurs. I was, you know, I was, I, you know, I directed the 1990 National Jewish Population Survey. It was found, you know, 51% uh, uh, or 53%, I don't remember the numbers at the time. In, in yeah, 52. Yeah, 52. Yeah, 52. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it, I, you know, I was dealing ranges, I'm a statistician. Um, but, but, but the fact is that, 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 that um, you know, that, that the, you know, there was a, Led to this kind of, uh, you know, the, the uh, what was the campaign called? I don't remember it. Um, it's not outreach. It's um, yeah. It, it was it was this, you know the, the attempt to renewal and Jewish renewal and Jewish revival. That kind of thing it was everybody got onto that and said, yeah, well this this is continuity. That's the word. Yes, the word was continuity. But it was a continuity response, and, and those you know a lot of organisations ran with that for their own needs and all the rest of it. I don't know to you know it's it, it's challenging response kind of thing. What's organic and what's artificial or resting? Mm -hmm. But you know this this cleans up the issue, right? I mean, to those people who say you know the, the problem, right, the problem, the challenge is the Jews are not quite sure where their boundaries are and who they are. What we've seen is whether we like it or not, 
the guys who I saw on, the, on TV and all these things yesterday are quite clear who, 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 they, who they're after. You know, they're quite clear. Well, I mean, they, they, at the moment, they have actually do most of the definitional boundary forming, don't they? Right? So even though I turn around and say I'm a good Jew, they might not agree with me tomorrow. Right? Because I, I may have let Uncle Joe down or, or the local imam or something said something or annoyed him. So I can, you know, suddenly, you know, find myself like any really good communists, you know, in the gulag along with all the, the Mensheviks. You know, it's, it's a terrible thing. So it, it's a real, it's a, it, and I think I think it's 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 it, it's fraught with a lot of things because it's a continuing thing. One of the one of the problems we have here is this is not a photograph; it's a moving, it's continuing thing. It's, it, it's a kind of soap opera as well. It, it's, it, the characters continue there, but I think that's one of the, the reality of this is, and it's very hard for people to to you know. We're back to my the whole point, which I started with, which is Julius books. It's always been with us, you know. It's prevalent. It's going to go. And, and it reinvents itself. And he, he gets into that kind of thing. It's a concept that I guess it, you know you can make it postmodernist if you wanted to. But it's it's around, you know, it's 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 there and, and you're also gonna have to deal with it. And all the, the point is that individuals themselves will make decisions and then somehow collectivity makes the decision. But that but the, the, the problem that I was trying to point out is the legitimacy and even the, the solidarity of 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 whatever it is, if they're a killer or not, you know, this is the whole question is what it is is your organisation of political institutions in leadership in relation to this, right? It's, it might so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with you. <laughs> Thank you. I already even said that your question, David, and the lady's question, and a few over here, they sort of all begin to talk about identify and how are they going to going to respond? What is the identified or a nucleus, will they stand up, will they opt, how will they respond? I mean, we have an issue about how you deal with the non-identified, which is a separate discussion, but if, if, will they respond, do they want to respond, do they want to deal with it within, what? The lady who responds. And, hey, Dave, okay. Yes, ma'am, good luck. Good luck, thank you. If all <laughs> questions can continue, here 